housing affordability is the top issue for many voters here in the state of Utah. So why does it feel so expensive to buy a home for so many people in our state? Today, we're just shy of $500,000 in the median sales price. If we keep that average going, by 2030, we're touching you know the mid 700s, which is kind of insane to think about. On this episode, we try to answer the question, how do we actually make homes more affordable for Utah families? Through another installment of Defending Enterprise with our feature contributor, Beth Akers. You're listening to Defending Ideas. Defending Ideas is a weekly podcast produced by Sutherland Institute. On this show, we are committed to renewing the principles of common sense conservatism, making you a better champion of sound ideas. Welcome back to another episode of Defending Ideas. I'm your host, Nick Dunn, and this week we're talking about something that's top of mind for many people around the country, especially here in Utah, and that is housing affordability. It's expensive to buy a house. Lots of folks in Utah who would like to purchase a home, especially those starting young families, are looking at the market and having a lot of questions about when will it be affordable again to buy a home here in Utah. So for that, it's time for another segment of our Defending Enterprise feature series. And for that, we welcome Beth Akers from the American Enterprise Institute. Beth, thanks for coming back. Glad to be back, Nick. So we we want to dive into this housing issue. You took the time and you spoke with several experts, both folks here in Utah and on the national level, to really understand, number one, why is it expensive in general, but especially here in Utah? And number two, what's what's on the horizon? Give us sort of a dose of optimism. So I, I want to lead off by mentioning in our newest issue brief from Sutherland Institute that asked likely voters in Utah, what are the top issues from a list of nine different issues that will influence how they vote in this election year? The number one issue was housing affordability. And this is true across all demographics when you break it out by by age, by family structure, by political party, by gender, housing affordability is a huge priority for voters. What do we need to know about that in the conversations that you had with these experts? Well, I think that the attention on this issue amongst voters is clear because I think our policymakers, our researchers, people who try to explore policy are also hot on this and in, seek, in seeking a solution. So the housing affordability question is just so complex. There's lots of different layers and trying to understand even where the problem is coming from, let alone thinking about what the solution is. But that's what we tried to do. So I had three different conversations, one with a local housing expert, a national housing expert, and then someone from the governor's office. Think about where can we go from here and what are the potential solutions? So, you know, we understood that there are a lot of issues coming from the national economic picture right now. That's quite flatly the interest rate issue. That's something that we talked about and can really only get better from where we are today. And then there's a lot of other complicated issues in terms of zoning, the way that we use public lands, and all of those things piled together. So we need to untangle those, and and we do, in these conversations. And uh, I think we have a a few more answers uh, at the end of these interviews. So Beth, you are a professional economist, so the hope is that by the end of this episode, all of our listeners can sort of be trained to be mini economists when That's it comes right. to the housing market <laughs> so we can understand it better. Yeah. And again, hopefully ha- have an appreciation for some of the ideas that are in play to, to improve the situation here in Utah and give folks uh, a little bit of optimism for things moving forward. That's the hope. <laughs> Say, so we're going to take a quick break and then jump right into the interviews with our Defending Enterprise segment with Beth Akers on this episode of Defending Ideas. Sutherland Institute is an independent, nonprofit public policy think tank based in Salt Lake City, Utah. Our mission is to defend the principles of the American founding and to strengthen the institutions of civil society essential for those principles to endure. Sutherland provides research, events, and multimedia to policymakers and the public to promote the principles of faith, family, freedom, opportunity, and responsibility. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back. You're listening to Defending Ideas. I'm Beth Akers, and this is the Defending Enterprise feature. I have with me today Dan Eskik. Dan is a senior research fellow at the Kem C. Gardner Policy Institute. He also serves as an adjunct professor of real estate market analysis at the University of Utah, and he's the director of research at Ivory Innovations. Dan, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. 
Hey, we're glad you're here because we need some answers here. <laughs> Everybody in Utah knows that housing is expensive, but you really know that housing is expensive. You're you're right in the research on this stuff. Yeah, and you know, I, I identify problems for mm -hmm. other people to solve. That's the perk of my job. <laughs> but okay. but yeah, I mean, w what's made Utah great has always been a great place for families, yeah. and it's been a destination and is a destination. I think will continue to be a destination, but. Mm -hmm. We've growth has been our constant companion, and, right. and now we're really feeling some of the consequences of that growth. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are feeling that. But tell us what the data says. I mean, if you look at how has pricing, housing prices have changed over time, what do you see? Yeah, I mean, if we go back to like 50 years, so 1970s, okay. and we look at um, just median sales price, mm -hmm. and it increases about just over 50% every seven years. So wow. the rolling average is our housing prices increase every seven years. Mm -hmm. So today we're just shy of $500,000 in the median sales price. Right. If we keep that average going by 2030, we're touching, you know, the se mid 700s, yeah. which is kind of insane to think about. Right. And very importantly, people's income is not growing at a pace that's anywhere near no. that 50% increase. No, no. If we look at the we measure housing affordability in many different ways, but one simple one is the median multiple. So if you divide the median house price by your household income, mm -hmm. what's that factor? So right. the affordable is considered about a three X, okay. meaning your house price is three times higher than your household income. And mm. we were like that, you know, early 2000s, the 90s, mm. we were in that two, two, two to three range, okay. we're pretty affordable. Yeah. And t today we're north of six. Oh, wow. So okay. we've doubled that gap. Yeah. So you don't have to follow the math on those numbers just no. to realize that basically what's happening is housing is getting more expensive and it's getting more expensive relative to how much people are earning. So people are yeah. really paying a lot more yeah. to just live and to exist in, in a home here yeah. in Utah. Yeah. And, you know, that's really been become prevalent everywhere since COVID, since 2020. Right. Well, tell me about that. What have the recent dynamics been? Because I know there's been a lot of changes. People are coming out here. Yeah. Um, all my East Coast friends are coming to Utah to live, and I'm sure yeah. that's having an effect on prices. Your friends are the problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, they are. Yeah. I won't, don't tell them that, yeah. but yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, when we look at demographics, so you know, the cliche is demographics is destiny. Mm -hmm. And in the US, we have sort of two, two major generations that have really wreaked havoc on the housing market. One's okay. the baby boomers and the other's millennials. Okay. When we look at, you know, how many millennials were hitting the into their thirties, mm -hmm. when we look at data, this is a first time home buyers in the age of thirty two. We have roughly north of thirty six million people in the US mm -hmm. that were churning hitting that first time home buyer potential from 2020 to 2025. Okay. So these years were always going to be ha high housing demand years. Right. So a big influx to the yeah. market. We got people wanting to buy, increase yeah. in demand, we'd call yeah. it in my economics textbooks. Yeah. And, and then overnight, we all know what happens and interest rates basically go to zero mm -hmm. by historic standards. Right. So this is before COVID. Yeah. Well, yep. but then with COVID, mm -hmm. they go down even lower. So right. you, you have this perfect storm of, you know, the forest is burning and we're dousing it with fire, mm -hmm. you know, forest being the housing market and interest rates being pouring fuel on the fire. And, right, right. you know, when we look at, for example, just how much interest rates have fallen. So from 2018 to beginning of 2021, you know, housing prices increased exponentially, but our monthly payment for mm -hmm. those purchases each month, mm -hmm. they've stayed flat. So they've stayed about fifteen hundred dollars okay. in Utah. That, yeah. was, that was sort of the median new mortgage payment. OK because pr interest rates were falling. Mm -hmm. Now, the median interest rate payment is roughly around three grand. Mm. That's not including like PMI, premium mortgage insurance, yeah. and right. other factors. So it's probably even higher than that. But if we just look at that price to interest rate swings, mm -hmm. we've they, they've driven up a most lot, of that. A cost. lot of that yeah. drive, yeah. yeah. Okay, so some of these things you're talking about are, are really national trends, right? This idea with yeah. the changing demographics, this people aging into yeah. wanting to buy homes. In the interest rates, yeah. of course, is a national issue. What's local to us here that are the that can explain what's yeah, been going more on? More of that, but on steroids. Okay, how, how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So, so and, and and part of we have to kind of peel back the onion and really look at what happened with the great financial crisis and what okay. it's done to the construction industry. Okay. It it, it really set us up for failure. Okay. With Tell this, us about the, that. The demographic cycle. You know, we, we, so when we look at construction, we look at we think of household formations 
as your primary drivers for housing demand, right? It's right. people getting married, friends moving in together. Right. You know, think Having kids. An, anybody yep. can be a household, right? Sure. So when we look at how fast household formed, form with how much housing gets built. Mm -hmm. So going back, you know, 1970s, every decade we've had more housing, slightly more housing being built than mm -hmm. households formed. So it was like a ratio of like mm -hmm. one to 1.2, 1, mm -hmm. you know, different, differs every decade. Yeah. Um, but it was always above one. Mm -hmm. and Meaning more houses. Than more houses. People, were, than, than new households wanting houses. Yes. Yeah. So we had a little bit of room in the market for the market to function. Mm -hmm. You get to the 2000s, it goes three to one. So for every household that forms, we built three housing units mm -hmm. because we had anybody and their dog could get a mortgage and right. that was what was driving housing demand. Right. It was credit that was driving housing demand. Right. Not, right. right. So what happens after that all collapses is the mm -hmm. construction industry gets eliminated. Okay. And so like we didn't recover our construction jobs in the US from the peak to like almost to 2020. Oh, okay. I can't got remember it. the exact year. It was like 2018, 2019. Yeah, yeah. We, so in that so we've got construction booming, houses are being sold. Yeah. Then we realize, and like, we, oh no. Then we enter this decade yeah. with um, still strong demographics. Mm -hmm. And for every one household that forms, only like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 housing units are built. Mm -hmm. So we quickly absorbed the excess supply from the previous sure. decade. Yeah. And now we're behind. So yeah. in Utah, for example, by 2017, we were 57,000 units short. Okay now because m money got cheaper and you know some some things opened up in our market from the development standpoint more mm -hmm. capacity we we cut that shortage almost in half mm -hmm. you know we went by 2021 we were down to 27,000 okay and, and that's 27,000 fewer single family homes than yeah. would like to be purchased right is that or rented or you or know we're, we look at just household formation to housing construction. Sure. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's probably even a more of a mismatch between what buyers want versus what the mar market has to offer. And mismatch is a great word because yeah. what you're describing here is just, you know, that what's there to buy is not the yeah. same as what people want to yeah. buy. And so and, and, that and, tension is maybe what's driving up these prices. Yeah. The, when we look at too, from what what's legally permissible, right? I, I said earlier, as we were kind of joking, like, the breakdown happens in the entitlement of land process. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you think about what, like think of a car. What if you're only allowed to build three types of cars, mm -hmm. right? And you have to build it to different specifications for every city or every state. Like mm -hmm. a Ford Focus would be an $80,000 car, Yeah. right? right. When, we, when we look at housing, if we look at it, how can we make the construction process more efficient? Yeah. It comes down to lo local laws and regulations. Mm -hmm. Does the city allow offsite mm. uh, construction to be inspected, yep. basically, right? I got it. So yep. th that's something that just kind of, that just passed. Okay. So th there's so many of these opportunities to, to sort of improve the process along the way. It's, it's a very um, disaggregated industry. So so part of it, the in industry bears s some responsibility here okay. too, I think. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it too is why is it so disaggregated? Sure. Part of it is because every community has these little tweaks, little rules that vary, but really like on the surface, it doesn't look different. Mm -hmm. You know, you put two houses side by side, one that's in Leighton, one that's in Provo. Right. Take the, take the mountains away and you don't know which one's which, right? Yeah. But th those building code or zoning codes and design standards are, very are probably different. completely different. Yeah. So does that offer room for improvement here? I mean, can, a bunch. can I, the state or, you know, offer some sort of like way to get these counties and, and yeah, cities on the same page? Th that's a good uh, question for Steve Waldrop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but, but, but I think, you know, efficiency is efficiency in any law mm -hmm. is the, the way for improvement yeah right yep. so you know and, and i think that's you know you look at other countries that build housing you know like japan is always a, a model so there's japanese companies buying u.s home builders mm -hmm. um, why are they buying u.s home builders because there's still a lot of growth happening in the u.s mm -hmm. right japan isn't growing but they're still building houses in factories in japan right. at a much faster rate than we ever could mm -hmm. so it's not like we have to invent the wheel right it just we have to get out of our own way. What do you think the role of zoning is in all of this? So zoning is, you know, the the con the constitution yeah. <laughs> for development, right? Um, and, and and really, you know, like 
what determines is what your house looks like, what's b- being built, it, it, it's zoning, mm-hmm. right? Like the building, the international building code, it's what's on the inside to make sure your structure doesn't fall apart. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't think anybody's going to argue against having a building code. Right. Right. But the zoning code, you know, the city predetermines what your house should look like mm-hmm. as a buyer. And, right. you know, part part of that co- co- is for a reason to make sure, you know, mm-hmm. we don't build horrendous things. But right. also, like, to, it's gotten to the point where it's, I feel like it's sort of like a lose-lose environment mm-hmm. where, you know, we, we get these boring neighborhoods yeah. in a lot of places. You yeah. know? Some some places do a better job than others, but... Well, is it your sense that the zoning regulations, you know, local to Utah, are driving more of this mismatch that's driving up the price of single-family yeah, homes? Th- yeah, I mean, when you look at the life cycle of a home, when you look at the life cycle of a home, mm-hmm. so take any home, say the home that's built today, mm-hmm. look in 30 years, when it was the cheapest, it was today. Yeah. And same goes for every home that was built in the 70s, whatever. Mm-hmm. So, but that entry price is Mm -hmm. set by the zoning code Mm -hmm. more or less because Mm -hmm. it determines the density Mm -hmm. that determines how you value your your land. So what you pay for your land determines is determined more or less by zoning. Mm -hmm. And then what you build, what you make your profits off of, you know, you have to put, 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 if it's, if the city is making you do a quarter acre lot, Mm -hmm. well, you got to have a, bigger home on there to, to make make it pencil if it's if the city's like i want to i want you to be in a quarter acre lot but i want a smaller home which mm-hmm. is rare but <laughs> then that even smaller home then has to be more expensive right. to offset the cost of that land so right. so so the more housing units you have on a per acre basis you're you're dividing that land cost to, to more people Mm -hmm. right because all the inputs the sticks and bricks they're pretty constant for the most part sure yeah between that house or that house yeah but it's that land component and then you know there's add-ons architectural requirements and stuff like that so right well dan i know you're a researcher you're not the the policy guy here necessarily but i mean what are you excited for in terms of you know avenues for policy change that you think are, you know, you have optimism could actually yeah. make a real difference for Utah families. Well, y- you know, h- housing sort of, to use that cliche, like housing makes strange bedfellows, mm. um, whether it's like super conservative think tanks or left leaning think tanks, yeah. you switch out a few words <laughs> and they all say the same thing on housing. So well, that's it, a good thing to hear. Yeah. Sometimes so when it's, we're on it's the like, same page. it's like, okay, <laughs> I, I think the way to bring our country back together is to, uh, you know, say we're going to put apartments in every community, and mm-hmm. I think everybody's going to get riled up and they're going to unify, yeah. <laughs> right, to oppose the apartments. That's okay. kind of my joke, but yeah. but I think you know it, it, it's it's really important because it's part of our like we're the it's the major factor in our wealth creation. So yeah, it, for, for Utah and everything, you know, we're we're a young state. We're we're going to get older, but relatively to the U.S. will be younger. So mm-hmm. where that's going to go is is really, we're kind of at this inflection point right mm-hmm. now in policy. We've never had so much attention on housing. That's right, yeah. And so to me, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Right, so the, the, the fact that we're, I, I think we're the most innovative, especially out of the red states mm-hmm. when it comes to this problem. Yeah. You know, some states are just like, do whatever you want, and then you have, you know, Houston mm-hmm. is the chaos, mm-hmm. right? And California is like the opposite mm-hmm. of, of that coin, right? right? Like on, on ideology. But but I think really like housing is one of those rare things where everybody can get on the same page about the problem. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, that's where I'm optimistic is we all know what the problem is. Right. And so there's no silver bullet. And it's almost like I love the movie Argo with Ben Affleck where they have to go rescue the hostages. Yeah. It's like this is the best bad idea we have. There's no bad ideas here (laughs) right now. Yeah. And so anything is up for for debate, I think, is worth looking at. Well, I think all those families who are on the sidelines right now renting but would love to buy would probably agree with you that the problem is very clear. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and and not to like bring us down a little bit, but, you know, like that median wealth of a homeowner is just under four hundred thousand dollars and it was in 2021 this is a u.s number yeah. of renter was just under eleven thousand mm-hmm. so it's like their car yeah maybe if it's paid off yeah so you think as we're getting older our dependency ratios you know we're going to have more people over 65 mm-hmm. how do we support them right. with the generation that's been priced out and like do we create a different avenue for wealth mm-hmm. right so so those are like the bigger picture policy th- discussion that I think need to happen at a national level yeah. is what do, w- w- what can the 
new, new generation mm -hmm. that's getting into their 20s, mm -hmm. if, the, if they're so pessimistic that about owning a home mm -hmm. like how do they go create wealth is yeah. it all are we doing like these crazy crypto funds and you know you're having like swings in the economy yeah well that's we a, a more conversation volatile. for another day but yeah. i would hope they're not doing the crypto fund <laughs> right but like wh where does the where do we yeah. create wealth for no, our it, 20 and you know and, it, and i think that's what you know you're right that's exactly what yeah. makes this a critical question because the fundamentals of our society is that that is where wealth creation happens it yeah. has happened for previous generations and without yeah. a, an obvious avenue going forward for another source of wealth creation like we better fix this problem so dan i think that's a great place to stop thank you for your work in this space I and we'll continue it. to follow that and, and thanks for being part of the conversation thanks for having me we're going to take a break and we'll be right back for a deeper dive into the issues you care about, read Sutherland Institute's official blog, Insights and Takeaways. You'll gain deep insights from policy experts and relevant takeaways voters need to know. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. I'm Beth Akers, and you're listening to the I Defending Enterprise feature. Today we have guest Scott Lincecum. Scott is the Vice President of General Economics and Trade at the Cato Institute. Thanks so much for joining us today, Scott. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Scott, we're talking about housing prices here in Utah today, but we brought you into the conversation to give us a bit more of a national perspective. And the place I want to start with that is probably the first hurdle that our consumers are hitting when they're going out and thinking about buying a house, which is interest rates. <laughs> right. So right. what's going on here? Why are interest rates so high? What What's happening? Yeah, well, so, you know, not to sound cliche, but you know, when you think about the housing market, you need to think about both uh, the demand side and the supply side. And interest rates... Uh, are a big thing affecting the demand side. In other words, the consumer side, right? Because uh, if as interest rates go up, your mortgage uh, payment gets bigger because you're paying more interest on the same size loan. Uh, and that can, if you, can, you, know, you can't make that payment, you're going to uh, not be able to buy the house that you wanted to buy, right? And so um, that, that will temper higher interest rates can temper uh, demand. And in this case, um, we're living through <clears throat> a higher interest rate environment. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. Uh, I won't bore you with the connection between uh, treasury yields and interest rates and all that. All you really, I think, for, your, for listeners out there need to know is that um, for a long time in the United States, uh, we were in a low rate environment. And really, you know, since basically the Great Recession, um, interest rates uh, set by the Fed were very low. Um, that has changed in our pandemic era for a lot of reasons, uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy, supply side stuff, you name it. Uh, in attempts to cool inflation, uh, the Fed's raising interest rates. But that trickles into the mortgage market and into the housing market. And so the long story short of it is that mortgage rates are much higher today, primarily because interest rates, as determined by the Fed, are, are higher today. Okay. And so let's back up. I mean, there may be listeners out here who've been hearing all, all these buzzwords in the news. We've got inflation. We've got everybody paying attention to what the Fed is doing. Rates are high. Um, what is the Fed? Why does it have anything to do with what I'm paying on the interest rate on my mortgage, Scott? Well, you know, the Federal Reserve is our central bank. It's in charge of U.S. monetary policy. It's relatively independent uh, from uh, the the rest of the U.S. government. And it's out there to, uh, it has a dual mandate. It's trying to keep inflation steady, shooting for around a 2% target, and then trying to keep uh, employment um, uh, full. So um, in the pandemic period, of course, inflation shot up well above 2%, and the Fed responds with monetary policy. Um, now, uh, and part of that is going to be uh, raising interest rates in an attempt to cool demand and and you know demand being part of the, the issue dictating prices, the other part being supply. 
uh, the, with the goal of uh, tempering inflation. So this, um, is, it, this is kind of what's supposed to be happening by design. The Fed yeah. is kind of saying, hey, let's cool things off. Let's make it really hard to get money by raising interest rates. Yeah, and at then- least, <laughs> right, I would say at least in the macro economic sense, right? Nationwide. Uh, The Fed, I don't think, is trying specifically to affect housing prices. It's trying to affect all prices. And the Fed doesn't have a ton of levers to do this. Uh, The big, big lever is interest rates. You raise interest rates, you can cool some demand, cost of credit goes up, our mortgage rates go up, a lot lot of things, particularly on the corporate side, go up. Uh, And that will cool consumption and cool demand. But, of course, again, because mortgage rates are tied to that, um, they're going to face it too. And I think, you know, maybe for listeners who haven't been in the housing market lately, it's it's important to know just how drastically the change has been. Um, You know, during, right, even right before the pandemic, but certainly in the early months of the pandemic, uh, you could get a mortgage for less than 3% uh, annual rate. Uh, now, rates are up to 7% or higher, depending on you know the week that you look. <clears throat> and that's a dramatic difference in the cost of owning a home, of having a mortgage. You could see your mortgage payment uh, go from, say, $1,000 a month to $1,500 a month, which, of course, that's a huge difference. Uh, that And it's all interest, right? If you're a guy like me who hates interest, that's just a depressing state of affairs because, um, you know, that's the cost of the debt that you're you're taking out to, to, to buy a house. Yeah. Well, OK, so let's be a little less depressing because someday these rates have to come down, right? I mean, is that where we're headed from here? And, you know, if I'm on the sidelines thinking about buying a house right now, but seeing that my payment is so high because of what market interest rates are, what's to come? What, what can people expect? Yeah, so there's good news, bad news there. Um, I think everybody in the markets, you know, like the big investment banks and all these economists, expect the Fed to start lowering interest rates this year, and do so. You know, everybody disagrees on the the number of rate cuts. They typically cut a quarter point at a time, so 0.025 percentage points. Um, but uh, you know, they're looking at three, four, five, six, it depends on the bank you you ask. So that's good. But it's also important to note that compared to those rock bottom, dirt cheap interest rates, we've all, I think, become used to, particularly if you're a millennial or younger, you've like never been an adult during a higher rate environment. And most people, though, do expect that interest rates are going to stay higher than we were used to, say, between 2009 and uh, 2020, um, th- and they, you know, they're going to be they're going to be higher. So, so yes, I mean, if you're, uh, you know, first, none of this is financial advice, right? Uh, lawyerly disclaimer. But um, if you're expecting rates to come down a bit, I would say, yeah, that's that's true. But don't don't expect uh, it to be uh, 20. 12 again or whatever. Okay, got it. All right. Well, I was looking for some good news from Scott. You gave, gave me like moderately good news. We'll see if we can get something else good out of you. It's still, <laughs> still to come. But all right. So um, that's that piece of it. And that's a big factor. But what else is happening? I mean, at a national level, what are the other moving pieces in housing that are contributing to what I think most people perceive as this persistent increase in housing costs that's maybe shutting some people out of the market of owning? Yeah, so I think we first need to stick to the demand side for a second. Um, the fact is that the pandemic, along with certain demographic things, have have boosted demand for single family housing in particular, but uh, a lot of housing in general. Um, demographics are the millennial generation, huge generation. I'm a I'm a Gen Xer. We're always overlooked. Basically, the two big ones are the boomers and then the millennials. So a lot of millennials are at uh, what you'd call prime home buying age, right? They're in their mid 30s, even early 40s now, believe it or not, with millennials. And they are they are looking to buy a house. They maybe have popped out a kid or two and they are ready for that picket fence life, right? And um, so that's been a substantial increase in in demand for single family housing. You know, they went from being, you know, living with a roommate in an apartment 
and now they, they want a house. So that's the first thing. But the pandemic was another big one. And the pandemic did two things. One is it caused people to say, eh, you know what? I don't want a roommate anymore, right? I want to I want to live by myself. So that increased demand for uh, single unit apartments or, or uh, because we're all remote work, not all remote workers, but working remotely, we need more space. So you need a two bedroom apartment, right? Um, and then the other thing is people decided um, there's been a push to move into the suburbs, again, somewhat because of remote work, somewhat because of social distancing, pandemic related stuff, some because of some of the things going on in certain downtown urban environments with you know crime and public safety or uh, empty commercial office buildings. If you've uh, you know gone to D.C. anytime recently, um, all of that is has pushed more people and businesses out into the suburbs. But that, again, is going to be uh, that that means more demand for, for single family housing. So, so those boosts of demand are hitting what I think in housing is the biggest issue and the biggest problem. And that's the, on the supply side. And just to be very clear for those like people who are listening, who don't live in economics every day, when you say this is the demand and a consumer side thing, this is literally people just want houses more than yeah. they wanted houses five or 10 years ago. And that's right. part of what's making them expensive. And importantly, they're wanting houses more than builders and sing and multifamily property owners expect it. Right. Cause that's a, that's a big part of it. So so now um, we've we've had a bit of a construction boom. That's good, um, and they're trying to catch up to that that demand. You know, it's a bit of a you know oh oh heck moment uh, where uh, they're trying to catch up. But the problem is on the supply side. Um, it's it's one a mechanical issue. You know, it takes a while to build a home or build a lot of homes. We weren't building a lot of homes, so we're in a big a, a bit of a hole. Uh, so it, you know, you, when you start in a hole, it, it takes longer to get out, particularly when you have these demand side pressures. But then the other big thing is policy, 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 policy. The fact is that over the last 30 plus years, um, localities particularly in high demand areas. So, you know, coastal megacities like New York and San Francisco, but also places like, um, you know, Dallas and Atlanta and Miami and elsewhere um, and places in Utah. I'm, I, I know I've read about Salt Lake uh, for sure, um, that these places have adopted more and more regulations on building and primarily through zoning codes that say you can't build uh, duplexes. You can't build uh, apartments above three stories. Uh, you have to have parking. You have to, so all these types of land use regulations, we call it, um, make it hard to build and hard to get permits. Um, that, and permitting is another big thing because we now have what we dorks call a vitocracy, which allows people who aren't home buyers or home builders, or home sellers. So people are just peripherally, peripherally involved in the process. Maybe they live in the neighborhood, or maybe they're just you know in hardcore environmentalists who live miles away. Well, our, a lot of our housing regulatory systems give those people not just a say, but an outright veto on the construction of new housing. Um, we also have uh, building codes that uh, don't allow for certain types of manufactured housing. Uh, and I don't, by the way, mean mobile homes. I mean like um, modular factory housing where you know you build a big chunk of the apartment complex is built at a factory and then it's sent to to where it's going to be and they're cool. It's very cool. They're going to get stacked on top of each other, all this kind of stuff. So so you, you throw that together with... Uh, permitting fees and property taxes, other supply side restrictions that are going to temper the supply of housing. And what you see in a lot of places, uh, particularly these high growth places, is demand simply outstripping supply, even in a higher interest rate environment. And the way we measure it is you look at things like uh, building permits issued per capita. So that gives you an idea of the number of units we're building per person. And it's still way below one, right? 
and and it's getting it's actually getting worse because more people are moving to some of these areas. Um, so that so that you know, let's you know when you have demand hitting restricted supply, what happens? Prices go up, and and that's very much what we're what we're seeing in the market in a lot. Of places. Now, Scott, let me ask you, you know, we're going to talk to some local experts um, up next about some of those issues specifically. But, you know, for folks who are following this issue and thinking about what their um, federal lawmakers are up to on this front, is there anything that they should be looking for? Well, unfortunately, you know, uh, this one of the things that makes housing so difficult is that so much of the important policy is local. Um, there is, uh, you don't even have to be a, a constitutional libertarian like me to, 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 to note that um, there's not that much that can be done at the federal level to boost housing supply, which again, this is primarily a supply problem. Right. Um, so policymakers at the federal level, they have a few uh, levers they can pull, but not that much. I, one of the things that they can do is they can look at construction costs, construction uh, in two big ways. I mean, building a house requires two main things. You need materials and you need people. So the federal government can affect those things. They can lower tariffs on construction materials. We have, believe it or not, tariffs on almost everything you need to make a house. Uh, to build a house. So lumber and nails and concrete and countertops, you name it. Um, lowering those tariffs, which are just taxes on imports, will lower prices a little bit for those materials. You make prices, you know, materials prices a little lower. It makes housing uh, cheaper to build. You tend to get a little more of it. So that's one area. Got it. So then, freer trade, which is generally benefits us in a lot of different ways, yeah. would also be good for housing, but and, maybe and, not yeah, a game changer. Yeah, not a game changer, but good, right? Yeah. You know, every little bit helps. And especially if you're at the federal level and you can't you can't change local zoning codes, that's a that's a a lever to pull. Another one is on immigration and labor, right? You know, uh, immigrants are disproportionately represented in the construction trades. And uh, restrictions on immigration mean uh, you're going to have fewer available immigrant workers. And again, partic particularly in construction that has so many uh, immigrants. So again, policymakers looking to uh, improve not just housing, but a lot of uh, low-skill labor uh, where we're seeing shortages in a lot of industries. Um, then you know immigration is is a lever to pull. Now that's freer yeah. movement of labor makes business cheaper, right? To right. operate, and that's again something that applies broadly across the economy, but um, maybe but it, able to help. And here particularly too. in housing, though, because again, immigrants tend to flock towards uh, low skill immigrants tend to, to work a lot in construction. So, um, so that's a that's why this is a particularly good lever for for housing. Now the. The, you always have to note, though, with immigration that it's not as easy. It's not as easy as trade because immigrants have to buy houses or live in houses, too. So there is demand side pressure there. Um, the general view is that it'll help a little bit, but you will have those demand side pressures. So it's not as easy as, as eliminating those trade barriers. Um, the, the third thing that, that the federal government can do is try to encourage localities to reform zoning and other land use regulation to to do to boost um, uh, to allow us for more supply, um, and they can do that. There are all sorts of levers that that the feds can pull. There, um, Obama administration, Trump administration, and Biden administration have all tried to just you know they say we'll give you the subsidies if you have looser zoning codes, that kind of stuff. So there's a little bit there. Um, so those three things I think are, are are worth doing, they're worth pursuing. One more, and this one I think applies to Utah in particular, um, is federal lands. Um, the federal government owns a lot of land, uh, particularly out west. And, and I'm not talking about Yellowstone National Park, just to be clear. I'm talking about a lot of stuff is just like scrub brush land in the middle of nowhere. Um, and a lot of that land in out west uh, abuts major metropolitan areas. 
So uh, you can basically build on one side of the line where the city is, but you can't build anything on the federal side. So uh, selling off a lot of that federal land uh, or handing it over to private entities or to municipalities just to, again, expand uh, the amount of buildable land could actually um, uh, help a good bit. And again, sure, sure. Predict- I know we'll have lots of mixed feelings on that one in our community, of course, but absolutely. It's it's directly addressing the supply issue that you described. Right. And this is this to be clear, and we wrote this in, in my book that came out last year which and the housing chapter. We are to be clear to your listeners, we are not talking about national parks. Uh, we're talking about federal lands that really don't have much environmental or conservationist uh, footprint or effect. Um, And so there's a lot of this land out there um, that uh, could be repurposed and done so in an environmentally friendly way. Scott, I think that's a great place for us to stop. Thank you so much for your time today. Again, we're going to take another break. This is Defending Ideas. I am Beth Akers, and you are listening to our Defending Enterprise feature. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with the latest policy debate that affects your life. The solution? Subscribe to Sutherland Institute's weekly newsletter, where you'll find in-depth insights from seasoned policy experts, compelling multimedia, and advance notice of special events. Visit SutherlandInstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. I'm Beth Akers, and you're listening to Defending Enterprise. I am joined now by Steve Waldrop. Steve is the Senior Advisor on Housing Strategy and Innovation for Utah Governor Spencer Cox. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Beth. Pleasure to be here. So I want to start out our conversation today by us listening to a clip from the governor's State of the State address. So let's listen to that. I believe the single greatest threat to our future prosperity is the price of housing, period. Housing attainability is a crisis in Utah and every state in the country. But but remember, remember, we aren't like the rest of the country. No one has figured this out yet. And, and I truly believe that we can. Steve, I'm not going to make you comment on the fact of Utah being weird or not. Um, but I do want to hear, what does the governor think can be done about this? Where are the policy levers to push on and what's the plan? Yeah, I, I actually, uh, I've been playing chicken little since I've been hired. I am the chicken little that goes around and says we are in a crisis. Mm. And I've been saying that for uh, prior to the time I was hired, uh, because I I do think that we have an existential crisis with housing. Mm -hmm. If you think about where our country came from and and what we're riding right now, we're riding the wave of homeownership equity that was created post-World War II. Mm -hmm. We built small, attainable homes. People could come and, and, you know, coming back from the war, we had the GI Bill that got education. We had the VA housing that we put up all over the country and these were 900 to 1200 square foot homes they Mm -hmm. had a carport people grew up in them and and actually survived they didn't uh, you know they didn't fall apart living in a small home and and since then we've grown in our expectations but as as the pricing has changed and wages haven't kept up with our pricing and now we have to reset and go back to to the roots of that kind of post-World War II type housing for our for our first homes. How do we get there, Steve? I mean, we're in this place where we've got tons of demand here in Utah for the homes. We've got maybe a dearth of supply of these starter homes in particular, like you mentioned. So where do we go? We have absolutely a, a shortage of supply. And that's what uh, our policies focused on over this last legislative session was how do we juice the supply side? Mm. Uh, because demand is there, right? Uh, but you know, when you're talking about a starter home being three hundred thousand dollars, I mean that that is just it still hurts my head to think about that. And it's out of reach for a lot of Utah families. Um, but but that's kind of where we are. Right. So we have to drive to that price point mm-hmm. right now. Uh, you know, if you go out and shop for what used to be a starter home, three bedroom, two path, two car garage, you're going to be paying over five hundred thousand dollars. Right. And so we need to go back to that, um, you know, kind of 900 to 1,200 square foot, uh, 300 to $350,000 home. And so we passed uh, or, or we encouraged the legislature and helped them pass uh, mm-hmm. a, a few bills, one of which 
created a liquidity fund okay. that allows lenders to receive deposits into their institution from the treasurer's fund. And they can receive that and, and pass that on to uh, builders only if they and the builders agree to build 60% of, of the development that they're financing mm -hmm. as starter homes that are attainable mm -hmm. at that price point, and they're also deed restricted for owner occupancy. Got it, okay, so how far out does that push us? How We need these builders to build. When is that gonna hit the market? Uh, the fund becomes available on May 1st. Okay. Part of my job right now is going around and doing the circuit and educating the builders. We've been in touch uh, through the legislative session with a lot of the uh, financial partners, the banks, and the credit unions that will have access to this money. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to pass that funding through to their um, builders at a at a rate of less than 7% right now okay. for an interest rate. I'll take it. Which is, yeah, very good, um, right. particularly when they're looking at 9 10 11%, 12% right now. So a lot of projects aren't penciling. Right. But this also drives the cities to, um, to be okay with smaller lots. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to have smaller lots because land costs are the biggest driver of, you know, our, our price increases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we have to have smaller lots. We have to make those uh, available to our builders. And, and the cities get what they want, which is ownership. Right. We don't want to create a bunch of rentals that, you know, again, we, when, we, when we create rentals, which is what we've been doing for the last few years, we just stratify our society even further. Mm -hmm. We drive more money to the top. We wipe out the middle class and their ability to gain equity, mm -hmm. and, and that, to me, again, creates long-term problems. Right, and so this isn't something that the state in itself can solve. I mean, are there tensions between city-level, state-level policies that make this harder to move forward? Yeah, I think, you know, you've got natural tension between the desires of the state to create in general, more attainable housing, more housing, mm -hmm. and then go to any neighborhood and say, hey, we want to put, uh, you know, some more density in your neighborhood. We mm -hmm. want to put more cars on your streets. Right. Uh, no, thank you. Right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that becomes, uh, in some cases, a pitchforks and torches exercise yeah. uh, against our local officials. Sure. Um, but again, we're trying to give the local officials the tools to say, hey, we're creating ownership here. This is for our teachers. This is for our firefighters, mm -hmm. our police officers. And, and so that gives them some ammunition to go back against, you know, kind of that, that we don't want any growth uh, notion to say this is for our kids mm -hmm. and the people that, that work and provide services here in our communities. Got it. So this sounds like a good step forward. And there was successful legislation passed to make this happen just this session. What else? Is there, are there other parts of the governor's plan to make housing less of a crisis for Utah families? Yeah, so the governor has, um, in his initial layout, we had an infrastructure fund, we had um, some uh, innovation funding, some support for uh, land trusts. Those things are all still in the mix. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this was a tough budget year in the legislature. We, right. had, uh, we didn't have the largesse that we've had over the past several years. Mm -hmm. Things kind of slowed down. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we focused on this uh, uh, particular approach to housing for this session. Yeah. Those other things are still in the mix. We, we really have some work to do now going forward, um, looking at our public lands. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about state and federal lands, you know, the kind of those large pieces, but we also have in our cities and our counties and our school districts. And, mm -hmm. you know, you think about water districts, we have parcels of land throughout the state that are frankly providing no value right now. They're okay. sitting vacant. Mm -hmm. Can we use those parcels of land? Can we create value in those by providing housing opportunities? Mm -hmm. Turn them into, uh, you know, taxable, tax revenue producing entities, but at the same time also create housing opportunities for our working Utahns. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. And what else? I mean, what do you think, if you had your druthers and we could pass anything tomorrow with the unlimited budget that you need to do it, where do you think there's the most promise in really moving the needle for affordability for families here? Well, you just gave me an unlimited budget, so I just buy everybody a house. <laughs> well, but right. that's probably a little unrealistic. Okay, well, let's, let's just assume... Something realistic. Let's just assume that you have some <laughs> internal constraints because you're a conservative thinker and don't that's wish right. to endlessly tax uh, Utah families. Yeah, no, I, I think the, the conservative approach to this is... Is what we did in this in this uh, latest legislation which is we're providing opportunity to the market mm -hmm. the market still does the underwriting the market still does the the 
valuation of what those are. Mm -hmm. We're not subsidizing really in, in any material sense. We're just creating opportunity. Right. And then the backside of that is that opportunity produces revenue as a, as a natural out flow of that economic activity we're creating economic value in our communities mm -hmm. so i would do more of what we just did i would do yeah. more of that and and again i think if we if we put the public lands piece senator lee has a very good proposal for um, adjacent uh, federal owned land adjacent to population centers mm -hmm. and trying to use that for housing creation which i think is a brilliant idea and yeah. i i think um, you know, if I could push that legislation, I think that's a game changer. Yeah. And Steve, I think it's compelling when you say, you know, basically you want to let the market solve this problem. And so the intervention that you've created with, you know, this most recent legislation is is leaving as much power in the hands of the market as you can, while also kind of giving it a nudge to move in the direction that that you think that um, would be best for the state. So I think that's an admirable direction and I'm, I'm pleased to know that future interventions will look really similar. What do you worry about if we didn't take that sort of tack? Well, I think, you know, the, the uh, I kind of view this role in the same way I did when I was in the legislature. It's, it's kind of the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Sure. If we can stop, you know, if we can first say we're not gonna mess things up mm -hmm. and then we can say okay given that we're not going to mess things up what can we do that's going to to create value but in a way that is responsible and responsive mm -hmm. um, you know if you look at the approach of a lot of other states i think uh, massachusetts just put four billion dollars into a grant fund mm. california has done the same thing w when you when you create what i call stupid money mm -hmm. which is money without consequence without risk people do not make the same decisions. I don't. Right. When somebody gives me free money, I my, my whole thought process changes. Yeah. And so we want to avoid that as much as possible. And so that's, again, that's what we did. We, The banks are at risk on this deal. The yes. developers are at risk on this deal. The homeowners are at risk on this deal. Right. The risk is all in the right place. The state is simply facilitating that risk to happen in a, in a responsible way. And a lot of the players here may not even know that this is underlying the transactions that they're involved in. I mean, homeowners don't necessarily know that this is, you know, the way that their house was built. And, you know, in the future when that house is resold, they won't know that this is a product of this sort of intervention. And right. I think that's good because I think that preserves the market structure as much as possible. And I applaud you for designing it in that way. Well, so. that's, that's the idea is, is to have an extreme light touch yeah um, because uh, you know and, and this is my own personal opinion and and I know I work for the government now <laughs> and and uh, but I've only been there for three months so I'm not totally you know tainted yet okay but, but, but when government gets involved in in private markets we generally screw things up mm -hmm. I mean just as a rule it, it's not the role there are, there are very appropriate roles for the government to play we protect public safety mm -hmm. we you know we we ensure that that regulations that are intended to uh, promote fairness and justice i mean those are the things that government does very well mm -hmm. competing in the private markets generally does not turn out well right uh, we create distortions um you know if if you look at uh, you know what we do with um Federal monies, which again are well intentioned, but you look at our low-income tax housing credit programs right now, which I wish I could take a you know a, a screwdriver to that and fix some things mm -hmm. because what we end up doing is we create concentrations of poverty. Right. And and when you create concentrations of poverty, as well intentioned as that is, you have all of these social issues that that flow out of that mm -hmm. um, that just aren't healthy. They're not healthy for our communities or the people that are living there. So, Steve, your job is to fix this big problem, this crisis that you're going around town crying about. How optimistic are you that there's going to be some real change for people who are maybe sidelined right now, unable to afford a house in Utah? I, when I when I was offered this job, um, the governor said housing is my number one, two, three, four, and five top priorities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, okay, if you're in, I can be in. I can come and, and work with you. And And I actually am extremely optimistic. I think... You know, when you look at the fabric of Utah, when you look at the fabric of our state, we have people here who genuinely want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think that can be said in every state. Um, I don't think you can say that, that the political structures in other states are genuinely trying to do the right thing first. Mm -hmm. 
sometimes it's an you know it's an outfall of what they do but but i think in utah we have uh both institutions and people that want to do the right thing that if you give them the opportunity to do the right thing they'll take it mm -hmm. And, and that's why I'm extremely optimistic that Utah is probably the most unique place that, that has the potential to solve this problem. We have the most social mobility, um, and, and that's just, that, that is just who we are. Right. And, and if the, the concern I have, I guess, is that if we don't solve this problem, that's what we lose. We right. lose our kids right. that go to places where the American dream is affordable, mm -hmm. um, states in the deep south right now. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Tennessee and Texas and, and Kansas and places where, uh, you know, where they feel like they can afford a home. If we don't solve this, we lose that fabric. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm tremendously optimistic that we are the place that can solve it. Well, I think that maybe is what the governor meant when he said that we are weird and we will be watching closely to see where this problem goes in the future. And thank you so much for your time and being with us. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Sometimes it's hard to keep up with the latest policy debate that affects your life. The solution? Subscribe to Sutherland Institute's weekly newsletter, where you'll find in-depth insights from seasoned policy experts, compelling multimedia, and advance notice of special events. Visit sutherlandinstitute.org. Welcome back to Defending Ideas. We're going to finish off the conversation with Beth to really just kind of recap what some of the main points are. There was a lot of, of meaty content in there. These are local and national experts that, that you talked with that really gave some deep analysis of what's going on in mm -hmm. Utah's housing market and nationally. And so, so just to start off, kind of some key points to remind our listeners as they think about this issue moving forward and as they talk about it with people in their community, with their elected officials, so here's a couple things that stood out to okay. me from, from your conversations. Yeah. Number one, when you talked with Scott Linscombe from Cato, and he's talking about interest rates mm -hmm. and what they've been historically, the burning question on my mind was, do we need to prepare ourselves for a new normal? Mm -hmm. That if interest rates are not going to be as low as they were in, in, in decades past, mm -hmm. help us manage expectations. Like, what should we be anticipating that can be a little bit optimistic, but maybe a little bit different than what it used to be. Right. So for a long time, interest rates were exceedingly low, so low that it, in fact, created problems. Look, look back at the, the mortgage crisis and the excess demand that came during that period of time. Um, so, yeah, what Scott said was we're not going all the way back there. And that's probably true. But I will say that what we're feeling right now is these extremely high rates. And when they even contract significantly, which they will, it's going to feel really different for home buyers. So I think people won't necessarily remember what it felt like when rates were exceedingly low. They're definitely going to feel it when rates go down. So it's going to get better. It may not be quite the same as it was in, say, 2012. Right. But it's going to be a lot better than it is now. Yeah. We don't want them to go all the way back. There are other problems that come with that. But yeah, it will ease up. So, so that's one point of optimism that's good for all of us to remember. Mm -hmm. the, the other one is that the, some of the folks you spoke with, they talked a lot about this idea of supply and demand, yeah. kind of very economics 101 kind of principle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the other questions that was on my mind listening to, th to those conversations was, if, if the issue is that supply is not keeping up with demand, why can't we just build faster? What's mm -hmm. stopping us from just turning up the volume on the supply of housing to keep up with demand. Well, economists love it. We can take like a really complex problem and say, oh, this is just really simple. It's just supply and demand. But that's really true here. I mean, there's not enough housing that looks like the housing that people want, given how much housing they want. And so that's, you're right, that's the problem to solve. Why can't we just pick up and build more houses today? Uh, well, you know, Scott gave us one answer, which is that it's expensive or more expensive than it should be to build houses because of the tariffs we have. Um, there's a problem with the types of housing that are being built, not necessarily matching the types of houses that people want to buy. Um, Steve talked about that at the end uh, with, with the new legislation that was passed in the state um, that will hope to align that a bit more so that builders are building the types of houses that uh, people would like. So it's not necessarily about necessarily expansion of the supply, but rather matching the supply to what it is that people want to buy. Houses are not all the same, as we know. <laughs> and then, you know, lastly, zoning came up a bunch of times in terms of constraining the supply of houses. But um, my takeaway was that there's no obvious answer here. Yeah, it seems like there's, there's a, a wide array of things that can be done to help move the needle 
in small to moderate ways from mm-hmm. a number, number of different angles. And even I think this expands beyond just the issue of housing, specifically as you mentioned that they were talking about zoning regulations. Yeah. And some of my past experience in local government where we were grappling with these e- issues and talking with mu- municipal le- level leaders and residents, mm-hmm. something that I remember hearing often was it's not that in all cases necessarily that people are, are just always fundamentally opposed to density, for example, you know, right. townhomes and condos and those kinds of things. But the, what they were concerned about was the other infrastructure around it. So mm-hmm. the transportation infrastructure in particular. Yeah. So you, you can build townhomes and condos if the, the infrastructure keeps pace with it. Mm-hmm. So, so there's it's almost kind of like a whack-a-mole game that yeah. because we're building communities, there are a lot of factors that go into it. It seems like that was reflected by these conversations that mm-hmm. a broad policy agenda that tries to move multiple dials at the same time in, in thoughtful ways yeah. is how we should be thinking about this rather than, well, just what's the one big, bold thing we can do? Is that a fair summary? I think that's summary? right. It's a complex problem, and I think the solution is going to be complex. And specifically when it comes to this zoning question, I think it might be a bit more of an art than a science. <laughs> so uh, I think that there's definitely enough interest and attention to this, that there's optimism, reason to think that things are going to get better, um, but it's not an easy fix. As the thing I want to end on was this idea of optimism, because this this is a tough issue. It affects all of us, mm-hmm. um, especially folks, as I mentioned at the top of the show, young families that are looking to start or grow their families and, and looking for homes for mm-hmm. those families. So it's it's top of mind. We, we talked about the survey data showing this is the top issue right. um, for so many likely voters here in Utah. But what was encouraging to me is this idea that some of what what your interview guests said were, number one, we all know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. That's kind of unique in policy issues to me that often there's disagreement or Mm -hmm. misunderstanding of what the core problem is. For this one, we know what it is. We're now in solutions mode. Mm -hmm. So that ought to be encouraging as well. Yeah, it makes me optimistic. And I think that people are fired up, the people who we need to be fired up about creating those solutions. So I think we're in a position of about to be trying a lot of things. And, you know, it's one of one of those things where, you know, you throw a bunch of things at the wall and some of them will stick and some won't. And um, we learn as we go. And, and you know, hopefully we can move in the direction of doing more of the things that seem to be working. Well, Beth, the, the last thing that was on my mind from these conversations was something that the governor's housing advisor, Steve Waldrop, said. And, and it was that Utah is the best equipped place to solve these housing affordability challenges. Mm-hmm. And again, that was it's encouraging, of course, coming from somebody who's a senior advisor to the governor, but also for all of us that we have the capacity to tackle really big things here in Utah. We have the highest social mobility. We ha- have some of the most engaged, volunteer-oriented citizens. We have arguably the best economy in the nation. Mm-hmm. You just go down the list of metrics that we have a really solid foundation to actually solve big problems like this. Right. And so again, I'm, I'm channeling that into Yes, it's a challenging issue, but we have very good reason to be optimistic that we can move the needle moving forward. I think that's right. And, you know, as a researcher, I'm always skeptical when we get uh, lawmakers, politicians saying things like that, that we're special. You know, we can we can make this change. Others can't. But, you know, as a researcher, there's a lot of evidence to support that. I mean, these like completely politically agnostic studies are showing that Salt Lake region has some of the best social mobility in the country. And so it's true. There really is something different here. And it may be that that's what helps us to solve this problem in a way that's better than what other regions are able to do. Well, Beth, thank you for taking your expertise and applying it to this issue, because it really does go back to just the fundamentals of a free enterprise system. Housing is a market. We want it to be a strong, thriving, flourishing market that provides options for people to get what they need for their families. So thanks for taking the time to talk with these local and national experts and help us put some understanding around this with that positive, optimistic spin. Absolutely. Thanks for having me do it. Well, that will do it for this episode of Defending Ideas, our special Defending Enterprise segment with Beth Akers from AEI. Before we finish, I want to remind you, if you've liked this episode, please visit DefendingIdeas.org. From there, you can access all of the podcast platforms wherever you like to listen to your shows, Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, wherever you listen, just search for Defending Ideas and click subscribe. You can also find access to short clips from this and previous discussions that you can use in your conversations with friends and family and that you can share on your social media platforms. Once again, that's defendingideas.org. And lastly, if you want to support the broad work of Sutherland Institute, 
please visit sutherlandinstitute.org slash donate. That is all for this episode of Defending Ideas from the Sutherland Institute in Salt Lake City. I'm Nick Dunn. We'll see you next time.